Okie dokie. All righty. Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to the fourth uh, live webinar uh, presentation of the 2022 Hidalgo County Employee Wellness Fair. I'll be starting off this webinar with a sound check. Um, if you can hear me clearly, please click the raised hand icon. Um, again, if you can hear me clearly, please click the raised hand icon. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, so before we get started, I would like to let everyone know that attendees do not have a microphone feature on this webinar. Um, if you have any questions, please utilize the chat box feature or the Q&A feature, and we will answer questions at the end of the webinar. Um, our speaker is Dr. Su Sujin Gogu from South Texas Health Systems. Dr. Sujin Gogu is a triple board certified physician in family medicine, sports medicine, and pain medicine, who is currently working in the Rio Grande Valley at South Texas Health System Clinics. His clinical focus is an underserved community where he provides quality care to his patients. He is a graduate from Edward Via College of Osteopathic Medicine in Blacksburg, Virginia. He completed his family medicine residency at the University of Texas Health Science Center in San Antonio, followed by a sports medicine fellowship at Texas A&M University in Bryan, and a pain medicine fellowship at Texas Pain Institute in, Adv in Fort Worth. Excuse me. Dr. Gogu serves on many boards and is active in many, many physician and patient advocacy groups, including being co-founder of Doctors in Politics to promote better health for every walk of life. Dr. Gogu is originally from San Antonio, Texas, and now lives in the Rio Grande Valley with his wife. They enjoy experiencing new cultures, working out, and spending time with friends and family. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Gogu. Yes, thank you. Thank you for, for being here, everybody. My name is Dr. Gogu, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. I'm going to share my screen here. Um, I hope it shows. I think it did show. Yes. Um, perfect. perfect. All right. So I'm going to be talking about healthy bones for life. Um, I think it's very important that we understand how important bone health is. Um, it can be very debilitating, um, especially towards the uh, latter part of an individual's life. Um, I got no disclosures to really um, talk about here today. So kind of the objectives we have today is kind of learn why bone health should matter to you now. You know, understand the disease called osteoporosis. I saw someone ask some questions about it, and I hope uh, this presentation will kind of uh, give some answers regarding uh, the disease process of osteoporosis. We'll learn about kind of prevention, screening, diagnosis, treatment, and I think a big one is fall prevention. So osteoporosis is a problem. You know, about 70% of people over the age of 65, you know, with osteoporosis have actually never been screened and they don't even know that they have osteoporosis. Um, and so that's really uh, not very good. Um, and a lot of this data comes from the American Bone Health. Um, and the annual incidences, if you look at osteoporosis, there's actually more that you diagnose of osteoporosis than breast cancer, strokes, and heart attacks. And so it just shows you um, how actually common this is. And I see this very often in my clinic um, because I do sports medicine and, and, and pain management. So I, I deal with a lot of people that obviously have bone health issues and, and osteoporosis being one of them. And so what is osteoporosis? And so osteoporosis really is a disease that's really characterized by the loss of bone mass. And it leads to fragile bones that unfortunately break very easily. And so if you look at this, uh, these two pictures here, you know, you see one, which is normal, which shows you all the turbiculae of the bone being, you know, kind of very close together. And then you can look at an osteoporotic picture on the right. And you can see that that bone matrix on the right is far more integrated that could give you better support than one on the left um, or one on, yeah, one on the right. I'm sorry, one on the right is one that's osteoporotic, one on the left is normal. And so you can see when the matrix is, is severely impaired, you know, obviously you're, you're osteoporotic and you can break your bones. And I think the big thing to really understand is bones really remodel every seven to 10 years. And so you really make new bones almost every to se every seven to 10 years. And so that's, that's great. You know, osteoblasts are the cells that really build your bone and osteoclasts are the ones that break down your bone. Um, and those are two things that, you know, we'll talk about as, as this presentation goes along. And so when you look at this, this graph here, you know, it just kind of shows you, you know, from the time that we're born to the time that, you know, we're um, much more elderly. 
Um, you can see that, you know, as we're born, especially if you look at young babies, their bones are really not even bones. They're just like cartilage. They're almost like they can, they can be bent, you know, they can, you know, they're, they're just not very hard. And as you get older, as babies age and we age as, you know, adults and kids and adolescents, our bones typically get stronger and stronger and stronger. Um, and usually our peak bone mass, we really hit that probably around the age 30. You know, I think that's re really when we when we get peak bone mass and hopefully retain that, you know, up until we're, you know, age 35 to 40. I think those are the years that, you know, individuals have the most bone mass that they're ever going to have. But once you start hitting 35 to 40, you know, your, your peak bone mass starts to decrease. And particularly after menopause um, for women, it decreases significantly. And, and that does, that's a lot of that is due to the secretion of estrogen and progesterone, which actually play a central role when you look at it in keeping um, bones strong. Um, and then as you get older and you, you know, you're not as active, you know, unfortunately, you know, your, your bones get weaker and weaker and weaker. And, uh, and this is the time that it gets concerning about osteoporosis. And that's why it's so important. I think when you're around the age 40, 45, that you really start to have an understanding of, you know, how can I keep my bones to be strong? So when I get to 65, 70, you know, I'm not an individual that's concerned about having a hip fracture and going to the emergency room or having a bone fracture, doing something very simple, such as stepping on a stone um, on the street and fracturing, for example, your, your fifth metatarsal bone. And so I think that's why it's very important to, to really kind of understand this. And so these are the risk factors for osteoporosis. These are things that unfortunately you can't change. You can't change um, uh, the gender. Uh, that you're born with. Um, you, you, you have hereditary where unfortunately, you know, your genetics play a role. Age, you know, the higher, the older you are, you know, the more propensity you are of developing osteoporosis. Fracture history, you know, plays a role for that. Um, medical conditions, you know, there's several medical conditions, and I'll go through this on the slide, that actually impact your bone health. And it's something, you know, it's very important for your primary care doctor and you as a patient to have a good conversation about that. And medications, medications, everyday medications actually play a very integral role um, with bone health. And so the risk factors, you know, for osteoporosis, these are things that you can do to help with keeping your bones strong. One, calcium consumption. Calcium consumption is a very integral role we get a lot of our calcium from our diet, but unfortunately we don't get enough of this, especially with the diets all of us probably consume with how busy we are with our day-to-day -day lives. Um, vitamin D intake plays an integral role um, as vitamin D is a second messenger that really activates a lot of the osteoblasts to really form bone. Um, and they play an integral as a second messenger with various signals in our body. Um, but unfortunately, vitamin D actually is activated with sunlight. And so you have to be outside um, to have active vitamin D that is functional. Um, smoking is very important, you know, to not smoke because um, that obviously impacts, you know, vascular blood supply. When you don't have good blood supply, that, infect, that affects healing. Um, alcohol consumption can cause electrolyte abnormalities. So if you're drinking too much alcohol, that obviously plays an integral role to developing osteoporosis. Physical activity plays a very important role. I don't know if you ever, you know, look um, at, you know, or keep track of like NASA or keep track of, you know, um, what goes on um, with people trying to land at the International Space Station um, and so forth. But usually a lot of those individuals, when they come back, you know, they actually can't even walk, you know, um, because they've been up in space so long and they're, you might be wondering, well, they're really physically active up there, but they have no gravity up there. They have no stress that they're putting on their bones and stress on your bones is a good thing. You know, that weight bearing is very good in terms of, you know, stimulating osteoblastiform and really keeping your bones strong. Posture is very integral as well. Um, obviously, if you maintain good posture, you know, that keeps your bones in certain alignment um, and you maintain those habits and um, you put 
stress in an appropriate manner on your spine that you don't put yourself at risk for compression fractures. It's amazing how many compression fractures I do see in individuals in their spine. Some of it stems from osteoporosis. Some of it stems from, you know, just poor posture, you know, from a young age. Medications, you know, play a huge role in that. I'll be presenting a slide on, you know, what medications do that. And low body weight, you know, if you have a BMI less than 20 and you're not getting the nutrients you're supposed to, that plays an integral role um, in um, having osteoporosis as well. These are some conditions that can cause medical conditions that cause osteoporosis. And a lot of this is due to things not being absorbed appropriately, things not getting synthesized appropriately, or things not getting formed appropriately. I won't go to the pathophysiology of every one of these diseases because that would take multitude of hours, but obviously disordered eating, alcoholism, cancers, celiac disease, Crohn's disease, Cushing's disease, hypogonadism, hyperthyroidism, liver disease, which is very prevalent here in the valley, malabsorption, rheumatoid arthritis, all of these are medical conditions that can cause your bones not to be strong. And these are medications that uh, can cause osteoporosis if done in excess. And so some of these that are name are proton pump inhibitors. A lot of times people have reflux, they have to take a daily Nexium. Well, that is a risk factor, but you have to weigh risks and benefits. And that's something you should talk to your primary care physician about. Um, anticoagulants, anticonvulsants, chemotherapy drugs, um, cyclosporine, tamoxifen, you know, SSRIs, which play an integral role for depression. Um, lithium, which plays a role for bipolar disorder. Methotrexate, which plays a role in rheumatoid arthritis or psoriasis steroids a lot of us uh, you know have gotten steroids you know whether it's steroid injections or you know steroids because we've gotten covid or you know we've been in the hospital or we've had an upper respiratory virus and we've gotten steroids if you're getting too many steroids you know that puts you at risk of osteoporosis a lot of synthroid um, which is a, a derivative that helps uh, individuals that are uh, hypothyroid and aromatase inhibitors um, as well. So these are all big medications. A lot of these people do take at some point in their lifetime or have taken or, or will be taking in their future. Um, and uh, these are uh, drugs that can unfortunately play a, a, a risk um, in getting osteoporosis. And obviously it's important to realize it's too much in excess um, can, can put you at that risk. Um, and so how do you like screen for this? Like, what can you do about this? You know, um, obviously there's a calculator that you could use if you have time. It's accessible at the AmericanBoneHealth.org, but literally you just punch in your age, your ethnicity, um, and uh, some other certain parameters, and you can see what your risk calculation is, is for getting a fracture. But typically, the diagnostic tool is if you're over the age of 65 or if you're um, uh, if you're a woman and you're over the age of 65 or if you're men and you're over 70 or if you're younger with the risk factor you should get a dexa scan and a dexa scan really evaluates you know where your bone strength is um, and that's very important because there's actually something you can do if you're osteopenic which is before osteoporosis or if you're osteoporotic there are actually medications that you can take to increase your bone density, increase your strength um, and so forth. And so that's very important um, to have that um, in idea. But you as a patient, you know, if you're starting to get easy wrist fractures, you're starting to lose your height, you know, it's amazing. Like when you're in your twenties and thirties, you might be, you know, five foot eight, but when you get to age 50, 55, you might get checked on the scale again. And you're like, why does that not match my driver's license? from 10 years ago. And a lot of it is just due to your bones. Um, you might be surprised you lost an inch in height and a lot of that is due to your bones. And so it's very important, you know, to, to just keep track of those parameters um, for yourself. And so this is the calculator that I was talking about. It's the four fracture risk calculator and it kind of estimates your risk, particularly in postmenopausal women and men over the age of 45. And you can really take this, uh, this, you can apply this calculator and see kind of where you're at from a standpoint of a risk of fracture. Um, and so that's really helpful um, to note. What we use uh, in our clinic, you know, uh, with the DEXA scan um, is we get these T-scores in individuals. And most people have a T-score from negative one to four. 
And we do T-scores in individual spines, their hips, and typically their femurs, um, which is the big bone in our legs. And we really try to see, you know, is the entire body at the same bone density that it should be. If it falls less than, a, less than one, then obviously you have low bone density. If it follows less than 2.5, that's concerning. And typically, uh, if you're an individual with osteoporosis, you should be on bisphosphonates, which are typically the medications that are given to individuals with osteoporosis. If you get to this category of low, low bone density, I think it's very important that you take vitamin D, you take calcium, and you really stay active. You know, that means walking, you know, um, trying to jog if you can jog, um, and just really just trying to stay active to put stress on your bones because bones remodel, and that's how you can um, keep your strength. And so the typical factors, you know, to preventing bone loss that we really can do is really three things. And I think I've mentioned this on previous slides, but really it summarizes it in three words, calcium, vitamin D, and weight bearing activity. If you do these three things, you can really prevent bone loss. And so the dynamic duo for, for bone health is really, you know, can you get a um, thousand to 1200 milligrams a day of calcium, you know, the body can only absorb 500 milligrams at a time. But if you can put that much in your system, at least the body can get that much as an, as they can absorb. And vitamin D, if you can get 800 to 2000 international units a day, um, that would be great um, to keep your bones strong. And the sun is not only an important factor to keeping your bones strong, um, unfortunately, as we get older, we don't absorb things in our body as quickly. Our body doesn't synthesize things as quickly. And so these, obviously these parameters can change, but if you can just keep this in mind, a thousand to 1200 milligrams a day or 800 to 2000 international units a day, or simply, if you can just take a multivitamin daily, a lot of the multivitamins have this, um, in their tablets, you could really, uh, play an integral role in, in keeping your bones, um, uh, strong. And this is, this tells you an idea, you know, of the calcium intake that really routine foods have, you know, like I mentioned, the body can only absorb 500 milligrams. And if you can take a thousand to 1200 a day, that would be great to give your body an opportunity to absorb 500. And if you look at just typical foods we have, it is very difficult to actually get 1000 to, uh, 1200 milligrams of calcium. You look at just basic foods that are out there like milk, you know, cheese, um, things that you think have high degrees of calcium, even that is not enough to get your daily sum of calcium. And if you look at the diets we consume, unfortunately, because we all live, live busy lifestyles, we don't get enough. And that's why it's, I think, very important to, to, to really take a multivitamin um, to help you get your calcium intake that you do need. Um, and if you typically, you know, look, um, at, um, a, a label, they really showcase, you know, how many servings there are and how many milligrams each serving has. And so you can calculate that very easily. Um, and then there's obviously calcium supplements, like I was talking about just isolated calcium supplements. I, I think this is, you know, I think if you can just take an, an oral multivitamin daily, I think that's really all you need, but there are isolated calcium supplements like calcium citrate, calcium carbonate. Um, and those, you know, you can take those and those can help you, but you also got to keep in mind, I put on a previous slide, you can't be one that takes so much calcium because that can actually be very harmful. Calcium can deposit in areas that you don't want it to deposit in your body. So it's very important. You kind of stick around that 1000 to, uh, 1200, uh, milligram range, um, when you're taking calcium. And a lot of times when you look at, you know, our, our boxes here, you know, you see calcium 30%, you know, and so forth. If you just put another zero there, that tells you how many milligrams of calcium you're getting generally. So if it says, you know, 90% calcium, well, you're probably getting 90, uh, 900 milligrams of calcium. So it's just a shorthand way to kind of know how to read a label because these labels sometimes can get very confusing. Um, and then, like I was mentioning, vitamin D is also very difficult to get through the diet, but more importantly, really difficult to get absorbed. Um, and so if you look at, you know, the international units that I was talking about on a previous slide, 
Um, here I said 800 to 2000 international units is really kind of what we're looking for. And if you look at salmon, you know, for example, or you look at, you know, sardines or milk, you know, you don't get that much calcium just by eating actually healthy meats and foods and milk and so forth. So it just tells you how important I think it is to really take that multivitamin and really sunlight is very important as well, because sunlight is what makes this vitamin D active and functional in your body. And so the last thing obviously is very important is exercise. You know, exercise is imperative for keeping um, individuals to have strong bones. And so that really begins with 30 minutes, three times a day. It's, it's not much time. When you look at how long one hour in, is in an individual's day, that's 4% of an individual's person's day. And so if you delegate that 30 minutes, you know, that's really, I'm asking for 2% of an individual's day just to, just to keep your bones strong, but also be active. You know, exercising plays a central role, not in only keeping your bones strong, but important for cardiovascular health, important for uh, preventing vascular disease, preventing diabetes, preventing high blood pressure, and also maintaining a good weight. And so just doing simple things like walking, weightlifting, jump roping, dancing, tennis, jogging, Pilates, yoga, you know, those are very important. And I think if you can maintain a workout of 30 minutes, three times a day, you know, that would really go a long ways to um, helping you live a long and healthy lifestyle um, as you uh, age uh, gracefully. And so exercise, you know, it prevents falls and it prevents fractures. I think it's, it's very important also to keep in mind how you can prevent these fractures from happening. A lot of times we break our bones because we were just acting irresponsibly or doing, trying to take a shortcut to an activity. So, you know, getting up from a chair, you know, without using arms is, 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 uh, is something that um, if you can do um, is great, but obviously if you need to, to use those arms, uh, those arm raises to get up, I think that's helpful. If you're an individual that can do modified squats, you know, uh, balance on one leg and so forth, you know, obviously that, that allows you to um, um, give you some room for error when you do have a, a loss of balance, a loss of strength or a loss of posture, um, because these modalities here, modified squats, you know, balancing on one leg, the Y exercise, getting up from your chair without using your arms, it's teaching you how to maintain your proprioception or really knowing your space. So if you do have a small stumble, you're able to maintain that balance to quickly uh, restore your posture and balance. Um, good strength and balance, you know, can help you prevent falls and fractures like I was uh, mentioning, but, you know, it's obviously important to, you know, try not to multitask, you know, don't be on your cell phone while you're going downstairs, you put yourself at risk of falling. Um, you know, remove trip hazards. If you're an individual that's got a lot of wires running around your house and you can trip on it, you know, that's not a good thing to do. Eyesight plays a central role in that as well. Um, it's unfortunately why a lot of elderly people probably do fall and do have a, a degree of balance. Um, one of the things I teach my medical students that really rotate with me is something called the Romberg test. Um, and why I ask medical students that question is I, I, I really want to see you know, what do they think balance is attributed to? And what balance is really attributed to is really three things, your eyesight, your ears, and your ability to hear, and, it's in, and then it's your spinal cord. And usually when two of those three are affected, that's when you have a, a propensity of falling. And so when you look at elderly individuals, a lot of times they have low back issues and they can't see well. Well, they put themselves at risk of falling. If you look at a lot of elderly individuals, a lot of times they can't see and they can't hear very well. They play, that plays a role in them falling. Your ears have semicircular canals, which play a central role in balance. If you close your eyes and you try to stand, you know, what is allowing you to keep your balance and your proprioception is actually your ears. Your ears have this mechanism um, at which they, 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 they tell your brain where you kind of are located at any given time. And those are your semicircular canals in your ear. Um, so your eyes are very important. Um, obviously keeping a nightlight on is very important. You know, getting your medications checked is very important. If you're an individual that's on high doses of, let's say for example, a water pill, like furosemide, for example, you know, that can, you know, cause you to urinate frequently and that can put you at risk of rushing to the bathroom often. So there's different things, different medications, you know, that can obviously um, play a central role for that. And I think you'd be amazed, but 2 million people land in the emergency room from a fall, you know, generally. 
And a lot of times, one fourth of those result in hospital stays. And a lot of those result in, you know, needing some form of surgery, unfortunately, because they fractured it so badly that they need it fixated. Um, and so treatments for osteoporosis, you know, I know nobody likes to take drugs, but I was talking to you about the T-score. And if your T-score is, you know, greater than 2.5, then you really need to be taking a bisphosphonate. And bisphosphonates, they can potentially have a side effect. That's why it's important your doctor prescribes them um, with your patients um, and, and them knowing those side effects. But it is very important that you get treated for this because if you do get a hip fracture, for example, hip fractures can really almost uh, decimate an individual to the point that their life expectancy can decrease very quickly, especially if you're older than the age of 65. And I don't like to be dormant like that, but, you know, hip fractures in elderly individuals greater than 65, you know, that there's a lot of blood vessels that are around that area. You don't move once you get a hip fracture, you get bedridden, you don't heal very well when you're elderly. And so that can play a big role in you um, decompensating and, and as an individual and just really having poor quality of life um, after you develop it. And so that's why I think it's very important, uh, especially if you're a patient and you're probably over the age of 60, that you really have a conversation with your primary care doctor about your bone health. I think it's very important. I order DEXA scans on my patients, um, uh, particularly individuals that have low back pain or hip pain and so forth, just to see kind of where their bone health is at to know if that needs to be treated. Um, and, I, and, I, and I don't treat patients just in that moment. You know, I'm trying, my goal as a, as a physician, as a sports and pain doc, is really having my patients age gracefully. And I think that's a conversation you always have to have with your primary care doctor. It's not about the present, it's about the future. And it's about aging gracefully and having good quality of life as you get older. And so those conversations are very important to have with your primary care doctor. And it's important to have those conversations that last you know, five to 10 minutes. Um, and so um, that's important. Um, and so, you know, um, unfortunately, you know, your risk of fracture, particularly if you're female out of 1000 women, you know, 500 oftentimes will suffer a fracture without the treatment for osteoporosis. And I see a lot of these fractures, unfortunately, that do come in my clinic, simple fractures, they step on a stone, like I had a patient today that stepped on a stone, um, while they're getting out of their car, and they fractured their fifth metatarsal. And, you know, it's something that we routinely do, you know, that I routinely do, you know, I go out in my yard, or I go out in my front uh, lawn to remove stones from or garden to remove plants and I step on a stone, but fortunately I don't fracture my foot, but that can happen if your bones are weak. And so it's very important to get that addressed. Um, and like I was talking to you on previous slides, you know, progression of spine fraction, compression fractures, you know, you decrease in height, you have a difficulty in breathing, your loss of appetite goes down. And, and this is how we, unfortunately, we see a lot of us age. And this does not have to be the case. You know, if you get good health, if you get uh, good primary care visits and you really take care of your bones, this will not happen. And you can see that this can happen pretty quickly in an individual. This is presented in netters, which is the gold standard that we look at for anatomy. But you can see that at age 55, how an individual's spine looks. At age 65, how they develop that kyphosis. And age 75, they develop even more kyphosis where they're leaning forward. And that is unfortunately can be prevented if uh, there's proper care that's being done. And so, you know, treating osteoporosis is kind of like wearing a seatbelt. You know, would you ever drive without your seatbelt? Um, you shouldn't, um, but, you know, I, I know sometimes uh, people do when they're in a hurry. But, you know, treating, you know, people with osteoporosis with bisphosphonates, it really reduces your, your, your fracture risk by almost 50%. So that is a big amount. Um, and so it's very important that if you do get a DEXA scan and you go to your primary care doctor and you have a T-score that's, let's say, less than 2.5, you know, that you are taking bisphosphonates because it reduces your risk of, um, uh, of getting a fracture. It's just like, you know, getting a flu vaccine, you know, you can obviously not get the flu vaccine and you can, you know, take that risk of not catching the flu. But if you get the vaccine, it reduces the flu vaccine, it reduces your risk of catching the flu. And it's the same concept. Um, and like I was talking to you about, bisphosphonates are really probably the, the, the gold standard. Fosomax is probably the one that's prescribed often. Um, there's other medications uh, as well, just depending on you know, how, what the degree of your, um, 
uh, osteoporosis is. I won't go into these in detail, but these play a role. I also think hormone therapy, you know, sometimes can play a role. You know, if you're an individual um, that's had, you know, um, a total hysterectomy along with your ovaries being removed as well, um, particularly your ovaries being removed, um, you know, that um, your ovaries play the central role of synthesizing estrogen and progesterone. And that could put you at a, a early risk of early menopause. And I think the other thing you also got to kind of keep in mind is the age of menopause typically is at age 50, but you know, with the lifestyles, you know, everyone is living and studies have actually shown that menopause is actually coming earlier and earlier um, for women. And um, I think that's something to, to, to have a conversation about if you're starting to experience menopausal symptoms earlier on um, in your life. And so, the important things, you know, to remember is, you know, always ask your doctor, you know, particularly about bone health. A lot of doctors forget about bone density scans just because they have to check up on other chronic conditions that are probably more important that they feel like, and this kind of gets ne neglected. And so ask your doctor if you're a candidate for a bone density scan, or if you're a candidate because you're on certain medications or have certain uh, medical problems that I discussed earlier. I think it's very important that, you know, patients have that onus uh, to sometimes ask their doctors or difficult questions. Um, and your doctor should have answers for those questions um, for you. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, and so, you know, really, you know, what's kind of next is really, you know, assess your bone health, try to slow your bone loss, like I mentioned, with calcium, vitamin D and weight bearing exercise, something you, you really can do if you're an individual in your 30s, 40s, or 50s, really try to prevent falls and fractures, you know, try to maintain good posture and, and, and really exercise um, and maintain good balance. And then if you're osteoporotic, you know, obviously speak to your physician um, about getting treated for osteoporosis, but really understand the consequences of no action. If you are osteoporotic and you do develop a fracture, it can be very debilitating and your life expectancy can decrease very quickly, especially if you're over the age of 65. And um, this is a, a slide about uh, kind of myself and kind of what I do. And if you have any questions, you guys are more than welcome to contact me or schedule a visit in my office. You know, my office number is here below, but otherwise, you know, that is pretty much the crux of my presentation. I'm sorry if I went over. No, everything's looking great. Thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation, Dr. Gogu. This is extremely informative. Um, and I know we already have so many questions coming in and, um, I know our employees really enjoyed, um, this webinar. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again. Um, so that way we can move on to the, uh, questions portion of the, uh, webinar. Okay. So let me look up some of our questions that we have here. Excuse the ringing in the background. Um, so somebody asked, can aquatic exercise benefit your bones? Yeah, absolutely, but not as much as I think um, activity that puts actual stress on your bones, such as you know walking, or you know doing um, some weights, lifting weights. And the only reason I say that is you're actually not stressing your bones when you're in the water. But if you're an individual that has you know severe osteoarthritis in your knees or hips, and that's really the only way that you can stay active, I would say something is better than nothing. And aquatic exercise is good, but if you could have your choice, I would probably say putting stress on your bones is better. I know somebody also asked about boxing. What would you recommend for boxing? Yeah, I think boxing is is great. You know, obviously, if you're fighting somebody, uh, that's not a good <laughs> thing because you put them at risk of getting a fracture. But I think if you're just doing like normal kickboxing, you know, on a bag and so forth, I think that's very helpful because that puts stress on um, your bones and stress on your bones is a good thing because it allows your bones to remodel and, and keep that strength. Awesome, thank you. Um, so somebody asks, uh, have you noticed any higher osteo cases or conditions specifically in the Valley compared to the national average or wherever you have practiced previously? If so, what conditions, thank you. Yeah, so, you know, osteoporosis I've actually seen here in the Valley and, you know, I wouldn't say it's probably to the national average. Um, and the only reason is osteoporosis is typically present just genetically in the Caucasian population that I've seen it more often. But I have seen it here in the Valley, uh, particularly in the Hispanic population um, as well. 
Um, and a lot of times, sometimes I see it probably higher because it's just neglected. You know, um, a lot of times for whatever reason, you know, patients have a harder time accessing care um, here in the Rio Grande Valley. And I think we just don't have enough physicians down here um, in the Rio Grande Valley. And if you go to, you know, physicians offices, a lot of times, unfortunately, you know, you're, 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 you have five minutes or two minutes with a doctor and, and, and it's unfortunate because you can't really get everything you need addressed properly in that spirit, in that time. Um, so that's why I think you can see a higher cases um, of certain disease processes here in the Valley compared to other areas. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you. Um, somebody else asks, um, do bone density scans require a medical referral and can we request them through our primary doctor? Absolutely. You can get bone density scans to your primary care physician. Absolutely. Excellent. Thank you. Um, somebody asks, can bones be affected by treatments such as chiropractic adjustments? What type of treat treatments are beneficial to bone health? For example, spinal manipulations, massages, and our reflexology sessions. Yeah, that's a good question. There's a lot to uh, decipher on that. You know, getting chiropractic care, you know, I, th I think if you're an individual that's probably, you know, greater than the age of 60, you know, I don't know if manipulating your bones is probably the wisest thing to do. And the only reason I say that is your bones, like I showed in that graph, you know, you don't know where you fall on that curve in terms of your bone strength. And the last thing you want to do is get a really aggressive manipulation and you fracture a bone and surprisingly or not, I've actually seen that happen. Um, I, I think chiropractic care is really good when your bones are kind of more or less in strong. Um, and I think that's typically from the ages 30 to 50, when I think a lot of us have good bone strength. Um, but I also, you know, I, I think it's important if you're having difficulty with your spine or you're having difficulty with your joints, you know, that you go see a, a physician for it. You know, you want to get evaluated to see, you know, is there a, a, something um, that's mechanically wrong, whether it's a ligament, whether it's, you know, a, a tendon, or is there some type of biologic process that's going on like rheumatoid or, or, you know, um, psoriasis or so forth. Um, and so I, 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 I'm kind of leery against patients kind of going directly straight to the chiropractor when they have a, a problem, because there could be more than just, you know, adjustment that's needed. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Um, and then we'll just go ahead and do one more question. Um, how much time outside is required to obtain enough vitamin D to keep bones healthy on a daily basis? Is that something you know, that's possible? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, and so the problem is everyone absorbs, you know, a, a different amount of vitamin D, but typically if you get, you know, at least 10 to 30 minutes, you know, of good sunlight. I'm not talking about sunlight in our backyard at 8 PM, but I'm talking about like midday, hot Valley, hundred degree sunlight, uh, 10 to 30 minutes. If you can get that uh, several times a week, you know, I think that should be good enough, but unfortunately sometimes that's not good enough. And I think the other thing you also got to keep in mind is if you have darker skin, you know, you may need a little bit more sunlight than normal just because your melanin is shielding um, the sun rays that activate, uh, the vitamin D. Um, and so you got to also keep that in mind. Oh, wow. That's very interesting. Um, all righty. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gogu for joining us today. Um, and thank you everyone for your participation. Uh, this concludes our fourth webinar of the 2022 Hidalgo County Employee Wellness Fair. Be sure to check out the rest of our online platform or join us in person at the Precinct 2 Indoor Sports Complex. If you have any questions, excuse me, uh, message us through our chat feature or email us at hidalgocounty.wellness uh, at co.hidalgo.tx.us. And we will see you all very soon. Thank you so much, Dr. Gogu. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye.